Brian, Brian, stop the tape. Okay, Mike. Oh, wait, rewind that scene, please. Rewind that scene. Rewind that scene. Rewind that scene. Rewind it. Rewind that scene. 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 I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Brian Bonds. And you're listening to Rewind That That Scene. Scene. Yes. And we want to thank you all for checking out our last episode on License to Drive. Double core reaction for you. And I really hope that you enjoyed it. Some great stories there. And we have a special movie today that, that really scared us as kids. I think over the years has grown a uh, strong, strong cult following. It's it's already in discussion for a reboot. Uh-huh. But Riz, why don't we tell them what movie it is? Okay, this is Are You Guys Ready? The Thing, 1982, baby. It's based off this book called Who Goes There by John W. Campbell, and then it was made into The Thing from Another World. Yes, that's it. But there's one thing for sure. If if there's one man who could, you know, make it as close and perfect, it would be John Carpenter to the original book or adaptation. Yeah. Yes. It's him, baby. Yes. I mean, what an amazing movie uh, and an amazing score, amazing cast. Uh, It really is just a scary film because you're kind of putting yourself in the position as these guys and these scientists and they're stuck in the middle of the fucking Arctic. Yeah, they're like in the middle of like Antarctica, right? They're like this research yeah. team, 11 dudes, fucking freezing, which seems to be a theme of a lot of the movies that we do is cold in tonality and cold literally. That's true. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, it's just fucking crazy location. Yeah. Uh, probably half of a set and half real. Yeah, it was, uh, the fucking dog and the helicopter flying over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fucking madness right off the start. You know yeah. some shit's gonna go down. Yeah, it's a great opening sequence to a movie. Yeah, starts getting crazy pretty fast. I'm I'm so glad this movie exists. It really is uh, scary. And Kurt Russell. Let's talk about his hair, dude. It took him a year yeah. to grow it out. A year, and also I kind of aspire to have that hair game. Dude, it's sick feather. It's like He's feathered. A man. Yeah, yeah, it's like layered and yeah. feathered hair. He's like a beautiful leader. He's strong, yeah. heroic. He always has the heroic roles. Probably one of our biggest inspirations as an actor. We love, we love Kurt Russell. Oh my god, Big Trouble in China. Yeah. Breakdown. Totally. And I think this is probably the first film where. Yeah, it is the first film we're talking about that. That Kurt Russell's in. And there'll be many more yeah. on this podcast that we discuss. Oh, yeah. It opened up on the same weekend as E.T. Oh, it's another film about a, you know, extraterrestrial Extra- life form oh, taking over God. organisms and imitating them. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it's like a shape shifting. It's like shape shifting. Yeah. You don't know, you know, if your friend is this fucking thing. You don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of trust. Yeah. Issues, a lot of fucking tension throughout the whole thing. It's true. This movie really just is unknown, about trust. Yeah. Just unknown shit the entire time out. And all your friends might die <laughs> in front of you. <laughs> it's it's true. dark. We were really just blown away and kind of shocked by um, some of the responses we got when we did our outreach to, to see... Um, you know, who involved with the lab research crew is left uh, and, and would love to chat with mm-hmm. us. And we got some great stories on today's episode. One person that we're, you know, so happy to have on is Mr. Peter Maloney, an incredible actor. He plays the meteorologist George Bennings. Bennings. Yeah. Bennings. Um, the epic kill. Oh, man, I'm so excited. Peter Maloney, come on down. Let's do it. How did you lead the role? as Bennings in The Thing. Love the original of uh, The Thing with James Arness as a monster. When I was a young man, you know, I brought it to my high school to show it to the rest of the kids in the auditorium. So I had a history with this film that I didn't know it would ever culminate in making the, 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 this movie uh, with John. I auditioned for the for the movie on Fifth Avenue and so with with uh, other other people were there who I knew other guys and we auditioned for John and David Foster who was uh, one of the producers. It was funny because we were auditioning in this oak paneled or walnut paneled, very English um, offices with um, framed. Uh, hunting prints on the wall, guys in red coats chasing a box down 
And there we were in this very formal kind of English setting, improvising for John and David. Disastrous scenes from the movie. I mean, John just set us up, and he just set us up with a situation, and he said, um, you're under attack by uh, this dreadful, dreadful, monstrous enemy. This enemy's going to kill you, and he's coming at you with all guns firing, and what do you do? And so we st we started improvising in this in this carpeted paneled room, uh, throwing chairs, turning tables over, hiding behind them, screaming, you know, I don't know what, pantomiming, tossing grenades to one another as we fought off this invisible enemy. And um, it was fun. It was a fun audition. You don't get too many like that. Usually you get some really lame dialogue you have to say, and that's it. But this was a chance to uh, make it up ourselves and to really enter into it. And they sat there watching, and then they interviewed us one by one. John said, um, how would you feel about working for six months on a movie in the most dangerous place in the world? Whoa. And I said, I've never had a bad time on a movie set. I just love acting in movies. David Foster said, well, what do you love about it? And I said, the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> the urn of coffee is there, always hot, for 24 hours a day. I was actually thinking of leaving my agency at the time and going with a different agent. She said, don't make any quick moves. I think you're going to get an offer for that science fiction movie. And I said, oh, really? Oh, great. And I did, and I accepted it, and packed up and, and moved to L.A. for six months. Six months was the length of the job, you know. It was the longest job I'd ever had in the movie. Essentially, it was all on a soundstage, I guess, right? And they, they made it, like, crazy cold. They started in July, and they made it. They had many, many, many air conditioners. They refrigerated it to 36 degrees, and we, therefore, when we spoke, we had, our breaths were seeing condensation coming out you know, into the air. But it was 110 in the valley, uh -huh. and there we were in 36 degrees. And when we went out for lunch to the commissary back and forth, I mean, it was like not particularly healthy thing to do, you know, going from one extreme to the other. Well, we were there for maybe uh, five months. We'd work on the set, and then when we weren't working on the set, we often had to be outside on the lot learning how to uh, use flamethrowers and fire extinguishers, how to start a building on fire and how to put it out. Uh, we had special effects guys, wonderful guys working with us on that. I had to work with a dog, the dog that infects me with, this, with the virus. That must have been scary. Well, it was. I was bit by a dog when I was a boy. It was a very traumatic thing. So I've always been kind of afraid of dogs. This was a big dog, you know. And it was okay. I don't think I was ever really uh, at ease with the dog. You know, I get to... I get to be scared of the dog when we're playing cards, and I holler at Clark, get this dog out of here, you know. When it goes under the table and starts sniffing my crotch or whatever the dog was doing <laughs> while I'm trying to play uh, poker. The whole movie was interesting. It was just, uh, and and so pleasurable to, to work on. I mean, John, you know, I can't tell you how great he was. He He had his... Friends on the crew, he had Dean Cundy, his uh, cinematographer, who he fought to have, and he won that fight with Universal to not have some old union guy with tradition to fight against. He had a, a guy with a, who thought the same way he did. You know, the death scene is insane, and you don't know... If it's really Bennings or pretending to be Bennings, it, I wanted to cry. I mean, this scene really? is, is, I is never nice. Heard such a, I never heard such a comment. That's such a nice thing to, to hear. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's an intense scene. It's sad to see Bennings go and transform. So how was that scene made? I mean, you, you're so expressive and, and, and really just... Uh, transform in that, in, that, in that moment. Well, it was a great uh, scene. It was the third death of Bennings because... The, uh, in Lancaster's script, Bennings dies by getting on a, a um, snowmobile or a thia call, as we call it in the script, in, in, in the movie, a thia call. And he gets the, the uh, thia call running and escape, uh, leaves the compound and goes off into the white uh, snow 
and uh, the, suddenly the earth opens, the, the, the permafrost opens, this whiteness, just like an earthquake opens, and these monster arms come up, wrap me and the thiacol in its monster arms, and pulls me down under the earth. End of Benning's. Oh, man. And uh, oh. so that's the, that's the uh, that's the death that we expected, you know, uh, yeah. as we sat down to work. We we worked for two weeks on an empty soundstage. All there was was a long table, a bunch of chairs, and a big blackboard and uh, coffee, and that was it. Um, we were there for two weeks talking about this story, and every moment of the story was analyzed. And John was absolutely intent on having us know what we were doing because it was a complex shoot and he wanted us to be well prepared. And one of the big arguments that we had constantly, I don't know that we ever even ended the argument, was if you are infected with the, with the virus, if you are the thing and your, your self has gone away, do you know it? Do you know that you have been transformed or taken over whose consciousness is it inside this monstrous being you know the virus just wants to survive and grow and take over so you know this it was an interesting question it's an existential question so we we argued about this oh i'd, I'd <laughs> nauseam. him i mean it really was yeah. uh, funny because now do I know I'm the thing at this moment? You know, yeah. that kind of question. And um, That's great. They wanted to create a claustrophobic atmosphere, which they certainly succeeded in doing. And one of the things is that they wanted to uh, have nobody able to get away. They didn't want anybody to get away for even a moment. So the idea of me, my mm -hmm. character, escaping on the fire call and then being taken down through the ice would be a shock to the audience, of course. But it wasn't, it wasn't really what John wanted. So they said, okay, he, we're going to rewrite this. So they rewrote the scene, and then we shot another death where I am killed by the thing in a different way. I'm walking by the, the dog Channel, and um, I see one of the dogs transforming into a monster dog. Yeah. And I, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And I push the button on the intercom box next to me, and, and, I, and McCready, uh, Kurt Russell's character, uh, answers, yes, yeah. I said, McCready, it's Bennings. I said, I'm, what, I'm down here with the dogs, Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. I, think, I, I, I don't know how to say it. It's just they're, they're, they're transforming. Transforming how? I said, it's just changing into something else. It's, it, you better get down here. He says, Bennings, Bennings. Yeah. Does it look like anyone we know? We know. <laughs> <laughs> I forget what it was. Oh. And, and meanwhile, while I'm on the, on the intercom, transfixed by this vision, which I'm inventing in my mind, of course, because we don't have the special effects. We're pretending that the special effects are there. Classic. So the camera is on me and on my left side looking past me, not into the kennel, but watching my reaction to what's taking place in the kennel. Wow. Down at the end of the corridor, a door opens, and a man walks out the door and down the hall towards me. Wearing our military uh, fatigues, you know, our uh, olive drab military yeah. costume, but he's also wearing a ski mask. You can't tell who it is. Huh. I don't hear him or see him. He gets up to me and wraps a barbed wire garrote around my neck Holy and pulls shit. with both hands, strangling me, lifts me up with one hand, very strong, and shoves a foot-long screwdriver into my right ear. All oh, my gosh. Oh, oh my head. gosh. Then rips open the chain link oh fence, my God. separating me from the dog monster, and hangs my body over the sharp chain link fence. End of scene. Oh my End God. of Benning's. 
And we oh shot that. Oh, man. Wow. Wow. It took a day to shoot that. And you can see a picture of that in that book. I don't know if you've seen that book that the British Film Institute published about the movie. Oh, no. we got to check that out. There's a picture of me dying that way with the garage around my neck. And uh, that's the scene. Who was it? Who was it? That's the problem. So anyway, they're watching the dailies. And um, the producers and John, John said, why would the thing who has transformed into Clark, the dog handler, the Richard Master character, why would the thing coming at, going after Bennings put a ski mask on his head? The only reason the ski mask exists is so that our audience for the movie doesn't know which of the characters did it. And he said, this is not that kind of a movie. We do not want to, we do not want to play that kind of game with this audience. That's not what we're interested in doing. He realized it was not in keeping with his vision of nobody knowing who's who. And, you know, it's a cheap, it, it's a cheap way to keep the audience in the dark. He, he didn't, John didn't think it was uh, honest or good to do it. So that was no good. I said, well, what are we going to do? I've got to die. He said, well, have a, we'll have a new scene written by the time we get up to the location in uh, British Columbia on the glacier. So I had to wait and, uh, until that was revealed to me. So we get up there. And uh, they built this beautiful set, the compound, you know, uh, in the, uh, and uh, built it in the summer, just south of Juneau on this glacier, and waited for winter, waited for the snow. Now, we started the shoot in July, early July, and at the, uh, sometime in December, we headed up there around the beginning of December. And, of course, the snow had come, and it was absolutely gorgeous, as you can see in the film. Um and we, we get to that location, and there was no room in the town of Stewart, British Columbia, for everybody. We could, weren't allowed to bring wives, girlfriends, lovers. Only the cast and crew could be there. There were two women. They were the caterers. Um, and we took up almost every room in this hotel. And we took up every room in the, in the Ramada Inn, which had restaurants, a banquet room, you know, rooms where you could play cards or something like that. There's no room for the locals, no room for the miners who worked up uh, on the mountain. So there was some hostility from the locals toward us. You get up there, and uh, I was a heavy smoker still at that time. Uh, I just smoked too much. I smoked all the time, constantly. Uh, Tommy Waits got really pissed off at me because I was smoking all the time and he 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 was not a smoker and he was always doing his yoga and um, I was disturbing him. We were in this compound so we had to stay in the... We all had to go up every day whether we were going to work or not. We had to get into costume in, in the motel, get on the bus. It was uh, uh, only uh, 25 miles away. It took uh, like an hour and a half to get there because we had to go so slowly on this mountain road in the snow with no guardrails Wow! on this mountain. They got higher and higher. And when the whiteout came with no, you know, where you can't see anything but white. Dangerous. Somebody had to get out of the bus and walk on the, on the drop-off side so that the driver could at least see that person and not take the bus off the edge of the cliff. I mean, it was dangerous. It was dangerous. And he had to call in every mile on his radio and say, this is Universal Bus 3, I'm at mile 27, um, so that they would know that, that we didn't experience some disaster before arriving wow. at, the, at the location. It's yeah. crazy. So we were in this uh, location, in this um, set, and... It was cold. It was really cold. You know, we've been pretending it was that cold in the, in, in the studio. Now we're in the real cold. And so they had heaters built into this um, compound. And But the problem is when they turned the heaters on for us, it melted the snow on the roof and ruined the look. Oh, man. So they wouldn't let us yeah. use the heaters. 
Oh. It ruined the beauty, the beauty <laughs> no. of, the lo- of the of the isolated location. It must have been freezing. And when you see it, when you see the movie, it is a beautiful, beautiful look. Um, and so we had little uh, little heaters on the on the floor with the radiating things in the top that went about three feet out. You had to sit huddled over them like a fire. But so we're in there. So they 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 came up with this death, which is the one you saw, the one that the only one that anybody saw except us. Maybe Joel Polis has just been killed, and we're getting his stuff out of the storage unit, storage area. And Tommy says, "I'm going out for a minute. I'll be back." You know, <laughs> as if yeah. what could happen while I'm away? You know, of course <laughs> we know what something's going to happen. And then I I'm discovered uh, with those awful. Um, Tentacles wrapped around me, yeah. around my bare torso. It was freezing cold, freezing cold, and wet. and because they were uh, dipping them in um, this jelly, uh, red jelly, uh, so it was so it would drip okay. off me and all over me. It was freezing cold. And then this death was was not an easy one because there I was with no shirt on. Just my jacket and these monster arms. They let me have Japan, these Japanese heater things that you put in your hand and you crack them. You crack the, you crack them and they make heat. You, you know, it's like a, yeah, uh, some kind of hand warmer. Yeah. So I mm. crack these, put them in my hands, and put my hands inside the monster arms. And I run out. I kneel in the snow. It was. 30 degrees below zero that night. Oh, oh my goodness. I think with the wind chill, God. 103 degrees below zero. It was <sighs> cold. The cameras were slowing sick. down. And John said, you know, this is up to you. you. If you cannot do this anymore, when you reach a point where you are in terrible distress, just tell us and we'll stop and we'll go inside. I don't remember doing that. I'm the kind of guy, and actors are the kind of people who will do anything to please the director, to try to help make make the thing the way they want it to be. You know, yeah. I think sometimes we put our lives in danger yeah. for the sake of the shot. You know, yeah, and um, incredible. I don't think I was in my life was in danger, but let me tell you, it was really, really uncomfortable. And then to have that uh, gasoline uh, drum kicked over by Mr. Russell, it flows towards me, and then he throws the the um, flare into it, and then I end up like a like a Buddhist monk protesting <laughs> the war in Vietnam. <laughs> or I don't know what. Yeah. It was a great scene. I mean, you know, it was great. It was fun. How many times does an actor get to do something like that? You know? Well, I feel like for Brian and I, that's yeah, that's like that, like the way like that whole scene is done and the light coming out of you, and it's just so <laughs> memorable. And that, that that's like stuck in our minds forever. <laughs> I love that scene. Yeah, now. yeah, it's beautifully shot. And then of course Don Don Moffat, Donald was the maybe the most he was the oldest of us, and he was the most cantankerous of us, and and the most questioning of, of things you know he really felt that in the script we hadn't you know we were very abrupt they were very abrupt uh, getting you know these deaths would take place and I remember uh, Donald arguing with, with John and in discussions uh, about it saying that he felt that he, he had to be allowed to express the fact that he and I were friends you know characters our characters were friends and um, there wasn't a lot of room for expressing what you felt about the death of a friend in this uh, awful situation. Because, you know, it was a lot of action to get through in the story. You know? And um, sentiment was not, um, any sentiment besides fear was not um, particularly welcome. On that note of fear, it's like the the thing is like the coronavirus right now in 2020. And absolutely, we think about it, and you just don't know who's got it, who might have it. Exactly. Or Governor Cuomo says, "Do not touch mom or grandma." You know, and you don't want to cause the death of another person inadvertently. So, 
It is absolutely like that. We don't know. It's the, as, as our great leader says, it's the, uh, the invisible enemy. We don't know who's got it. Right, right. Even if we have it. And so we have to protect other people and we have to protect ourselves. So put on your mask, put on your gloves, and don't touch your face. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter Maloney. Can you imagine shooting all those different endings? In the cold, you know? I mean, like freezing, yeah. just like, that's just crazy like, shit. Yeah, as an actor, like you're going to go through three different murder scenes? Yeah, and I honestly, I, I can't imagine the film now knowing this with those other endings. Uh, it's it's such a, yeah. his ending is probably, you know, like to, to his character's, one of the best, and when 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 McCready throws oh, the man. fire stick on him outside, is and like yeah, like the, yeah. Like the gasoline or whatever is like lights and him that up. noise. <gasps> so it's also a little bit low pan. I was expecting yeah, yeah, lights yeah. to come out of his and, eyes, and it's crazy. Yeah, when he's like you know getting his like guts like wrapped around him, and he was like in the office a second ago, oh. and then he's outside with a coat on. It's fucking creepy shit. Dude. Yeah. Dude, how do we how do we find these other endings? Do you think we should yeah, ask him for the tapes? We gotta go to his house and find the tapes or call Club into Beta SPs, <laughs> mini DV tapes. Imagine, imagine film thirty five millimeter transfer to mini DV. <laughs> so who else we have next, Bon Bon? This person is a really awesome actor. We've learned a lot in our first conversation with him on our last episode about License to Drive. He's been in an incredible amount of movies and and just really a uh, fantastic person. And I'm glad that he agreed to be on this episode. Richard Masser, who plays Clark. We love Masser. Bring him on. Clark. So you have a great relationship with the dogs. Especially that one tracking shot where you're coming in and, and you put him in, into the gate area right. with the well, other dogs. Like, what was it like training? Like, that must have been something. Uh, I went in the very first day of. Uh, we had two weeks rehearsal on the film, and uh, I went in a week early and met with the dog trainer and and Jed, who was the who was the 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 hero dog. Uh, Jed was the beautiful great dog. Then he had a double whose name was Jake. And Jake was this kind of goofy, friendly. His markings were similar, but he was kind of, he didn't have at all the same face. Uh, his, fa his face was really like just a goofy face. He was a really sweet dog. And Jed was half wolf, and he was really, he had that amazing <laughs> look. Um, and Jed was a relatively young dog. He was a little over a year, maybe 18 months old, and he had only done one other thing working. So he had not been around a lot of people. <laughs> he hadn't been, a lot of, uh, been around a lot of crew. He hadn't, uh, you know, now before uh, John cast him for the, to be the dog, he had the dog do some things, and the dog was very, very well trained. But he was still very wolf-like. He was very skitzy. I wouldn't say he was easily distracted, but he he had a whole other level of consciousness going on, unlike a dog's. Um, so he was very sensitive, I guess is the best way to say it. So when I first went to meet him, um, I uh, talked with Clint for a while, and then we walked over to his crate uh, where where he was lying down, and Clint and I, he, Clint said, "Now we're just going to stand here and have a conversation for a while, and then Jed will see that I know you and you're okay and everything's okay, and then I'm going to let him out, and then I'm going to um, I'm going to talk to him a little bit, and you just stand there, let him do whatever he does." So Jed comes out, and he kind of shies away from me for a second, and he walks around me, comes over, starts sniffing me, and then you know, jumps away a little bit and <laughs> then Clint is talking to him and then Clint has him sit and he sits and he gives him a treat and and then he hands me a treat and he said, hold the treat for a second and he says, sit and he said, now give it to him and I gave it to him. He said, everything's fine. So then we just started working together <laughs> and, and he had, there are these little like uh, plywood circles that they put a piece of carpeting on and they use those as marks, and they train the dogs to mark. So uh, uh, he, Jed knows if he goes to the mark, he's going to get a treat. 
So he would have me go and, and, and place a mark down and then stand next to it. And then he would tell Jed, Mark, and then he'd give me the treat beforehand. So Jed would come, he would, he would go to the mark, he'd step on the mark, and I'd, I'd treat him. And we did that back and forth and back and forth till he was really used to kind of coming to me. And then uh, he, he took the mark away and he would say, go with, or some command like that. And Jed would come over to me and he'd, and he'd stand next to me or he'd sit next to me and I'd treat him. And then we started doing it where I didn't treat him and he'd just wait there until I would bend down and praise him. That's how this this transference, uh, how Clint set this up, there was no negative reinforcement. It was all positive. And he wanted Jed to respond to me with no treats because when you see dogs in films, a lot of the time, you'll notice the dog is looking not exactly at the person he's supposed to be looking at. He's looking just past the person because the trainer's just off camera and the trainer's holding him in a position. Or, that, or the dog will come over and the dog is staring at the guy's hand because he knows there's a treat coming or he's expecting a treat. And, and Clint said, I don't want any of that. And then we did this thing where in the soundstage uh, prior to shooting that sequence, this was like two or three weeks. Whenever I had a break from rehearsal, I would go over and i work with Jed. He had us go into the set and practice just walking down that that walk with him just walking right next to me and stopping when I stopped. And then I'd open the door and he'd look at me and I'd go, it's okay, go ahead. And he'd go in. And we did that over and over <laughs> yeah. again until he knew exactly what it was that was expected of him. And he was, he was smart as hell. Then the complicating factor came when there were all these other people on the set and Clint was not positive how he was going to react, and it ended up he, he reacted really, really well. But the other thing I'll just tell you is after we'd been working for about a week or so and Jed was very comfortable with me, uh, after uh, uh, Jed and I had been w working together for a little over a week, Clint came into where we, uh, we were on a soundstage sitting around a table doing these rehearsals, and he came into that soundstage, which was dark, and he said, come and just uh, come over here and let's... And he brought Jed with him. And we sat uh, against a wall uh, quite a ways away from the other people. And we just sat there. And uh, Jed, you know, Jed laid down between us. Mm -hmm. And we were just sitting there. And then all of a sudden, he snapped his head around and stared at me. Now, Clint had warned me that the w wolves do this thing <laughs> where they don't growl, they don't bark, they just give you... They look at you. And then they go for you, okay? So Jed gave me this look, oh. and Clint grabbed him by the sides of his cheeks, and he, and he turned his head toward him, and he said, leave it, leave it, because he knew Jed, for some reason, just decided oh. I was the devil in that moment. Holy and he was, he, you know, it was like he was just about to go for me, and Clint called him off. So, uh, <laughs> And that look, by the way, you see that in the film because Clint taught him to do that on command. He would go look, and Glenn, uh, and and wow, and uh, and Jed would drop into that into that frozen kind of gaze right naturally, but it was artificial. Wow. He would he was pretending. That's crazy. But when he looked at me, it was very very different than when he would do it on command. Uh, I mean, it still looked spooky on command, but it felt a lot weirder in the dark soundstage when he did that. Anyway, the reason Clint brought him in was we then went off into a little side area that had been, was like a little, uh, like a prop room that was empty. And we went in there and he said, I'm going to have you go out and bring one of the other guys in one at a time. And I want to introduce them to Jed. And I just want to have Jed meet them and also see if he'll work around them. So I brought each one in individually and each of these guys was different. You know, some of them were like really relaxed. Charlie Hallahan, he should rest in peace. Charlie was so nervous around this dog and it made Jed completely freaked out. You know, Jed was like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? <laughs> Clint gave him a treat and Clint was having him, you know, sit and, stay and you know look and do some different things but he kept looking over at charlie because 
Charlie was just like vibrating. He was so nervous. So Clint gave him a treat for Jed. He had him sit in front of Charlie. And then he said, give him the treat. And Charlie put his hand out. He was shaking so much. And the (laughs) treat just fell out of his hand. And Jed just looked at him like, what is your fucking problem? (laughs) So that was Charlie. And then a few, uh, mostly everybody he was just fine with. And they were, you know, they were a little nervous uh, with him or whatever. But mostly not. And then, and then Kurt came in, and Jed wouldn't go near him. He wouldn't yeah. work. He wouldn't do anything on command. He just kept pacing. He kept moving to the other end of the room. And Clint saying, have you been around horses lately? And he said, no. He said, because he really doesn't like horses. But, wow, I've never seen him do this before. He just didn't want to be near Kurt. Now, he got over it eventually. But Clint did all that so that he would have a memory of having met these people through these two transitional figures, first him, then me, and because I knew them, that would be the connection. He was the most uh, sensitive animal trainer I've ever been around. He was really amazing. They still, whenever he was working, the set was locked down. Nobody was on the set that didn't have to be. And uh, sometimes I would be there just to be another kind of steadying influence. For Jed, that's all. So that's the dog story. The film holds this tension that the characters have in in the cast. It's it's a really unique crew. What's your favorite scene in the film that you're involved with? My favorite scene isn't in the film anymore. Uh, But we shot for, I think it was um, seven or eight weeks, maybe a little longer, on set at Universal all the interiors and a little bit of like quasi exterior stuff. Then we shut down for like a month and a half, two months. And then we went up to, um, well, it was British Columbia, but it was right on the Alaska, British Columbia border. And we shot the, the exteriors out there. What happened was in between, they did a rough assemblage of everything they'd shot, which was probably three quarters or more of the film. And, John looked at it and he was, he said, this is a boring film about a guy, a bunch of guys sitting around talking. Well, yeah, because he hadn't shot the exteriors yet, but it wasn't boring, you know. And part of what happened was in that rehearsal period, we developed all these relationship things. Some of them were in the script, but some of them we enhanced by sitting around the table and talking about it and stuff. And like Keith David and I, Um, Childs was a hard ass with everybody. And I was completely didn't give a fuck about any of the people. So, but the two of us, we were the (laughs) two biggest guys. We faced off all the time. We were always on each other. And we shot a couple of scenes in the rec room that we then reshot the the scene, which is a very famous scene from the movie where uh, where Kurt is burning the blood. He's out there burning the blood blood bags in the snow, and um, and we're all standing there, and he and he does this speech about I know I'm human. I don't know about the rest of you, and blah blah blah. That scene was entirely done in the in the in the rec room originally. Um, I, I, I don't know if the burning of the blood bags was part of the scene originally. I don't remember or how we did that if it was. But that was that was done in the rec room originally, and it was a great scene. There was so much tension. And the whole point, the book, if you read the book, Who Goes There, which is the basis for all the films, really, but stayed the closest to that of, of any of the films, to the original uh, novella. And and the whole point was, if you went outside, you would die, which is true. In Antarctica, in the winter, you, there's no escape. You can't leave. You can't go outside. So you're trapped together inside. So, And when they do go out to that, that shack that McCready's supposed to live in, where they end up putting um, Wilfred. There's a rope, and it's you know it's it's really it's it's dangerous to go just that little walk from one place to the other. So the idea that we're all going to go out there and stand there while McCready makes a fucking speech is insane. It didn't make a whit of sense. And but John was just 
he was worried that the film was going to be boring. And it wasn't. I swear to God, it wasn't. So my favorite scene isn't in the movie anymore. But of the ones that are left in the movie, I guess my favorite scene is... Uh, is the one where um, I just because it's me, it's, it's that you know, uh, um, I don't know what's in there, but it's weird and pissed off, whatever it is. It's uh, the scene where I'm on the on the kind of uh, intercom and, and talking to everybody <laughs> yeah. and telling them to get down there. I have grown to really love the movie, even with the changes John made. At first, when I first saw the movie, I was so disturbed by. When we were shooting, when we reshot all that stuff, I kept saying to John, why are you doing this? And my favorite line in the picture, of course, is, you got to be fucking kidding me, David Clennon's line, <laughs> which is the best line in the yeah. entire movie after Charlie Hallahan's head comes off and it goes, sprouts legs <laughs> and go crawling out, it goes crawling out the door. Um, and, and I don't know, did, did, yeah, did anybody talk to you about that scene? Uh, no, not really. Yeah, if you want to elaborate on that one, I know that's definitely iconic for sure. It's so, yeah, visually Well, crazy. I mean, there were several amazing things. First of all, you know, we so we shoot this. Um, there are all kinds of substitutions going on through that whole sequence because first it's there's Charlie on the table with Dysart on his knees working on Charlie. Then they take Charlie out and they put... Dysart in, and, and Dysart's still there, but they have the dummy there with the chest that opens. So he's working on him, working on him, and then boom, his arms go into the chest. Then they take Dysart out, and they bring in this guy who came in that morning, who had been in makeup for five hours when we all got there, and was sitting around for another four or five, getting ready for it to shoot. <laughs> And he was a double amputee, a guy who had lost both arms in an industrial accident. Oh, my God. Who they fit, fit these prosthetics onto, which were ragged stumps with blood tubes running through them. There's no CGI in this movie. Uh, it's all Crazy. rubber and, you know, and miniatures and, and effect shots, which is what, it's the last great rubber movie. You know, it just... It's, yeah. it's a great, Rob Bottin was a genius. And it, all of us went by and stopped and said hi to this guy. And, and he was so thrilled. We were appalled that this <laughs> seemed so exploitative and horrible. I mean, nowadays they would do it yeah. with some green s sleeves over, uh, you know, over the actor's hands. And they'd, they'd paint in the stumps later, you know, with CGI. And they just green screen it. You know, yeah. stage blood pumping out of tubes, and he had a dice heart mask put on, also with this grimace on his face. So, so you see him with his flat flopping his arms, uh, his stumps back and forth, and blood spewing out. And all we could think of was this guy is going to be damaged for the rest <laughs> of his life after oh. reliving this horrible trauma that he Man. actually experienced. Yeah. The, obviously, wow. we didn't do the, the head coming off and the neck dripping down and the head dropping. All that stuff was done later on the effects stage. Rob shot all that in stop motion and uh, rubber and puppets and what have you. But so we're reacting to things that aren't actually there. I mean, some stuff was there, but that one was not there. And, um, yeah. And so we, we shoot all these angles in the scene of us all looking at this and carpenters talking us through it and we we had something on the floor that they dragged out so we would all follow it together and you know blah 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 so we go through all this and he says okay great so we're out of the scene now we're moving on and the and the ad says we're moving on and i said what wait john you you didn't cover clennon on this you didn't take it he said what do you mean I said, you didn't get a close-up of Kleinen saying the line. He said, no, 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 that line, you know, because he had storyboarded the entire movie. And in the storyboard that was made by this guy who makes comic books and storyboards, in the storyboard, that line is printed over a shot of the thing crawling out. He said, no, 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 that line is going to come over that. I said, John, you have to shoot him saying the line. It's the best line in the fucking movie. You you got to get a shot of Clennon saying, you got to be fucking kidding me. Because it was also, he said it amazingly. 
also so he said all right fuck it okay let's okay let's set up so it you know we took five minutes he blew he he whipped out a shot of clennon doing it a couple of times and that's the biggest laugh in the movie you know it's because everybody's everybody's sitting there in the theater or at home now watching this with their jaws on the floor, you're like, what the fuck is going on? And then somebody <laughs> articulates what everybody is thinking. And you laugh, and it's a great tension release. <laughs> and the fact that he was going to play that off camera is still mind-fucking to me. I just can't believe that that ever would have happened. Yeah. But it didn't, thank God. So Nice. You know, you spoke up about it, and you know, he, he did it, and that's, that's awesome. That's crazy. It's good. Yeah, John, John really has a good time when he shoots, and he likes, he likes to have a very loosey-goosey atmosphere. But he did say partway through the movie when we were talking about something in the setup for a scene, and he said, the worst thing I ever did was to have rehearsal on this movie. <laughs> and he's, he was so fucking wrong oh, oh, okay. because all the you know because we we all we all had ideas then we continued to have ideas and we right. continued to express them you know but it, the movie benefited tremendously because uh, so you know great. everybody tom thomas waits comes in with these with these strange you know kind of you know hipster glasses um and he and he said he yeah, wanted yeah. to be called Windows, and they put it in the script. You know, it was just <laughs> completely idiotic, but it defined his character. You know, he was he was kind of a dick. You know, I mean, he was a, a goofy, <laughs> nerdy guy, and and you know, and it was it was a great <laughs> choice, but it was also an actor choice because he wanted you know he. Uh, you know, we we all wanted to distinguish ourselves from each other. You know, so we weren't just this mass of guys. You know, and we all did. I'd partly, it was in uh, Lancaster's script for sure, but a lot of it was uh, he put together a lot of strong character actors. There, there are, there weren't any weak actors in that film. Um, Absolutely. You know, and we all knew how to stand up for ourselves. Oh, that's for sure. And at one point. We were all sitting around talking. I don't know if anybody told you this one. Uh, you know, there were like 10, 11 of us sitting around in a circle, and Wilfred is sitting there like kind of chuckling to himself uh, humorlessly. And uh, I, somebody said, I don't know if it was me, somebody else, and he said, what's so funny? He says, well, you guys, you, you still think this movie is about us. It isn't about us. It's about the rubber guy. Don't you know that yet? This movie isn't about us. <laughs> and, and we all went, no, no, don't be silly. So, yeah, it was. It was about the rubber guy. You know? so, uh, but, but to be perfectly honest, he was wrong also because, you know, when I go, I do, I've never done any fan stuff of any kind. And I got a call that I want to go to Germany and do one of these horror show um, conventions. And they'd pay for me to go to Germany and blah, blah, blah. And I'd never been to that part of the world. And I'd never been to that part of Europe. And so my wife and I, you know, we decided, okay, let's do this. So I went and I did it. And it was a really stinko little convention. Um, uh, but, but the people were so at once weird and at once wonderful. Uh, you know, on the one hand, they were just like, you know, there were people dressed up as Jason and as Mike and, you know, a, a, this bloody face and that. And then there were people who were just dressed like in track suits and whatever. But they were all just so thrilled to be there. And there were like three of us from the film. I think it was Joel Polis and Thomas Waits and me were there. And, and, uh, and and they were so sweet. They were so thrilled to see us. The, I, I can't even describe it. And then I got asked if I wanted to do a, some others. And I've done about six or eight of them all together. And what I'm constantly struck by is how much the people love the people in the movie. 
you know, how much they cared about all the people and were upset like when I get killed and, and was sure that I was the thing and that I wasn't and they were so upset that I didn't change and, you know, and I was a real guy and McCready killed me and what was wrong, you know. And, and whenever that would happen, I would want to say to Wilfred, you still think the movie was about the, the, the rubber guy? Well, it is, obviously. That's what the movie's about. But, but it's also about these men, you know. And this thing has had legs for 30 years, whatever it is, 35 maybe now, 40? Yes, I don't yes, know what of it course. Is. 40, I guess, maybe. McCready and so. Childs, they could have got coronavirus. Current day coronavirus is the thing. Oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, it's an unknown, you know, it's right, like an right, unknown right, enemy. Exactly, it's like exactly, so crazy. Exactly. Yeah. Did you guys do any wild partying? You know, I know 12, 12 guys going out to the bars in Alaska. No, but there was nobody to party with. You know? <laughs> it was just, uh, there was just us. <laughs> okay. Everybody else comes out putting their parkas on. And I said to John, I want to I wanna come out just with my shirt on and just very calmly be there and, and, and kind of distinguish this guy from the rest of them. Like he really is of the environment. And John liked the idea. So if you notice, if you go back and you look at it, everybody else is, throws on their parkas and they're all covered up. Um, except for me, I'm just, I got my cap and my, my indoor shirt and underwear on and that's it. And my, you know, and my pants and boots, sure. And so when the dog comes over, it's, you know, it's these two match souls that belong in the environment. As much as the dog belongs in the environment, Clark belongs in the environment. That's what I wanted it to look like. So the, the, the shot when they turned around on us was... I would come through the door, I would walk over, Clint would send Jed to me, and I would kneel there next to him, calming him down and petting him, and then they cut. And in that space of time, I lost all feeling in my hands, my face went numb, it was that cold. It was so oh, damn. unbelievably cold. Wow. Out. But the other side of that is it, the buildings were shells. All the buildings up in Alaska were shells. They were just, you know, plywood structures. There was no insulation. There was nothing. They were for, you know, exterior shots only. We never shot indoors there. And weirdly, you know, we would be outside. We'd be all, all you know, in our parkas. And our, I had wool pants, and I also had these down overalls that went over the wool pants, which I didn't use in that shot. But when I had the overalls on and I had the parka on, which was most of the time I was outside, I was warm as toast. You know, big gloves, everything like that. When we would go back inside, they would have, we had salamanders, you know, which are like these, these big gas uh, propane powered heaters that blast heat out. And we had them in there that would that took the chill off and it took it from like 30 below zero to 20 degrees. But it felt so warm to us that we would, we would peel down to our underwear, to our long underwear. Um, you know, we'd take off our shirts even. It was so hot in there compared to outside, but it was 20 degrees inside. That's how crazy cold it was up there. Did you ever notice uh, that Donald Moffat uh, had mittens that were hanging around his neck on a strap and that he uh, and that it stayed on the strap whenever they were on his hands no yeah that's right his yeah, if you go back those. and you watch the film you'll see it and he got the idea from pictures of scott in in um going to uh the south pole he had had these made specially so he because if you lost your gloves, you would lose your hand and eventually your arm if you didn't cut your hand off. In order to not lose his gloves, but be able to, at need, take them off for a short period of time, but not have to worry about where they were. And he had these straps made out of webbing with it, and it, it went around the neck. And also there was a chest piece to keep it on s securely. And the, the webbing was long enough so he could freely move his arms in any direction, but he could shake the mittens off 
and let them dangle like a little kid. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and have them ready if he needed them. Well, Donald described that they made them for him and he used that all during the film and we all thought it was the weirdest thing in the world and then i saw stuff about scott at the south pole and there they were on all the men he had them made for all his men on that expedition where everybody died so everybody brought this some piece of specialness to their character that they to 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 make them different from everybody That's else. That's super cool. Yeah, they're all very distinct. You know, I'll close with this question. You have such a strong bond with Jed. Um, you know, and and of course, uh, you know, some revenge with uh, with McCready. You know, do you think uh, do you think you and Jed will ever well, reconnect he's, he's again? He's long gone, and his <laughs> son is long gone. Also, you know that they, oh, they don't live that it. long. You know, it's uh, a, <laughs> yeah. a dog that size. I think Jed. Jed worked till he was about eleven or twelve, I think, which is pretty long. Um, yeah, but he he didn't yeah. uh, he died around that time, and then he had a he a, Clint managed to get a son off him that he also trained, but he wasn't Jed, you know, because Jed was a wolf husky mix, and um, you know, when the son was a yeah. wolf husky mixed with I don't know what, I don't think he bred it to another wolf. I think it was probably with a husky. Um, so it was, uh, he wasn't as big, he wasn't as rangy. The Jed was really tall yeah, and yeah. lanky, um, and had that really long face. But I will tell you that Clint came to my house a couple of times and both times he brought Mike and Jed uh, when he came. So I got to see both of oh, them. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. And, and once I went out to visit him at a, uh, the ranch where he where he worked with the animals and lived. That's great. Now, one great thing about dogs is they, they remember when they're reminded, but they don't carry shit around with them, you know. The first day I was there, um, first full day, I got it at night, and, you know, I had some drinks with everybody, had something to eat, went to bed, and then the next day we all got on the bus, and they're all explaining to me what the drill is and, you know, how horrible the bus ride is and one thing and another. So we get up to where we're going. And by the way, the bus trip was a little nauseating because it was a lot of switchbacks. But we, I'm sure Peter told you this, we, on the way up, we, we are going up this thing called the Salmon River, um, up to the Salmon Glacier. And, and the river, at, as you would expect, is filled with salmon and more bald eagles than anyone's ever seen in their life. And they were all feasting on salmon. It was crazy. I'm sure there were bear around, but we didn't see any. But the eagles were everywhere. Wow. And and on the drive from the airport up to the up to Stewart, which was like a two hour drive, I saw tons of eagles, but nothing like what we saw on the on the bus ride up. Anyway. That's so on the way back, Kurt, you know, that night, Kurt says, You haven't been hydrized yet. And I said, What? Uh, and he said, you haven't been hydrized. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. So Stewart, British Columbia is two miles from Hyder, Alaska. Okay. And they're separated by, there was, a, um, a, you know, there's a little road that runs along this thing called the Portland Canal, which then the Salmon River drains into the Portland Canal, which is an in inlet from the, from the Pacific Ocean. And it's the longest fjord in North America, the Portland Canal. And there are steep rock walls on each side. And along one side between the, um, between the water and the cliff, there's just enough room for a road and a little bit of a shoulder. So you go on that road for two miles. You go through Hyder, and then you go a little further, and then you go back into British Columbia. It's a little piece of Alaska that just sticks out. So the Salmon Glacier where we shot was actually in British Columbia, and it held the snowfall record for North America at that time, which was, I think, 98 feet in one season, 98 feet of snow, not inches, feet. Um, so anyway, um, um, Hyder had wow. a population of like 15 people, and there were like seven bars, and during the hunting season and, and also the miners, because there were uh, 
mines around there. They were the patrons and, you know, Saturday, Sunday craziness, um, uh, Friday, Saturday, I guess. And then most of the rest of the time, no. But we were there in the winter. We were there in December when none of that's going on. So it was basically just us and the 15 people who live in Hyder. So early on, I think maybe the first or second night, one of the guys, probably Kurt, got off in Hyder and said, I'll walk back the rest of the way. And he went to, ran to the bars and he went into this place called the Hyder Inn. And the Hyder Inn had or has, probably still there, a bar that was made from a gigantic whole tree that was then sliced down the middle and polished. The, the, the cut part was polished, but it was a tree trunk that ran, it, it must have run 40, 50 feet. It was enormous. Um, and, and maybe oh, wow. three feet across, four <laughs> feet across. Huge tree. Nice. Um, and old, it had been there a long time. There were, you know, all kinds of divots and scars in the wood and everything, but it was beautiful. And then, you know, shitty, bad, shitty stools and whatever. So Kurt <laughs> and I get off the bus and, and like I said, I, Kurt or someone discovered it. And then all the guys ended up going there because the drill is this, in order to get hydrized, you, they, you go and you say, I'd like to get hydrized, and they bring you, you know those juice glasses, those four-ounce juice glasses, the little skinny glasses? Um, they bring <laughs> yeah, you a yeah. juice glass filled with pure grain alcohol. So that's yeah. like about between eight and ten shots of liquor in one glass. Oh, and they, so they, I know where this is going. They, they bring you that. And Holy shit. And what you do is you <laughs> toss it all back in one shot, turn it upside down, the empty glass upside down on the thing. They let it sit there for a second. The guy lights a match, lifts the glass, and and lights it, and boom, it makes this big puff. <laughs> and then you're hydrized. So I, I did that. Kurt and I got off, and then we walked back together, and it was so cold. But again, we were totally dressed for it. Um, and it, it was like this brilliantly clear night, you know, in a, in a completely lightless area. So you could see a billion stars and with the, with the Portland canal on one side and this sheer cliff face on the other. And we walked back for like a mile, mile and a quarter and on, or no, two miles, I guess it was. And halfway there was this burned out husk of a building and I said to Kurt what's that and he said oh that was that was the customs office between the US and Canada and <laughs> that's like the fifth one they've had and every time they put one up it's so that the Canadians who go to Alaska to drink because the liquor is much cheaper in Alaska than it is in the United States um, um, uh, and they'd buy liquor there and they'd want to bring it back and then the customs people would stop them and charge them duty on the liquor. <laughs> and so, so um, um, every, every time they'd build one of these, um, a, a few days later, someone would come in the middle of the night and burn it down. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> so that was the, wow. that was the awesome. customs, customs office between <laughs> Hyder, Alaska and, and, uh, and Stewart, British Columbia. It was probably my most unforgettable moment on the that and the Eagles, on the whole yeah. on the whole film was was that walk and talk with Kurt. Uh, uh, it was really great, and and we'd known each other for a while by then, but uh, but we never had that much solid time just to shoot the shit, you know. Thank you so much, Richard Master, for joining us again, Clark. You are the man. Can you imagine like a one on one? Hank's bar session with yeah. Kurt Russell. Well, how intimate and beautiful of a moment that must be in some remote bumblefuck yeah. bar. I mean, it's pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> Love that. Like, that story yeah. should be like a painting. God, I'm uh, jealous. It really is the two of them, Cl Fucking Clark and McCready, were walking home. And because Kurt Russell, you know, McCready shoots him in the head. It's, it's fucked up in the blood testing scene when when he finds out that he he actually wasn't infected by 
Yeah, it's it's he true. Was, he's yeah. a straight up murderer. But it would have gotten to him. He was a dog lover. He was pissed that they shot at at the dog originally. And let's talk about that that dog bond, dude. He was like a natural dog whisperer. Like you just feel like that him and that dog spent years together. That's how good that and that tracking shot coming up to the, the where the dog's oh, behind the cages. So good. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. That dog remembered him, man. Yeah. They had a bond. And and that and that shows. And I love that Richard again was suggesting some great creative ideas to, oh, to Carpenter. Yeah. I, I love that scene when the head walks out and, and that actor goes, Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I mean I mean again, it's like, you know, some directors don't want actors speaking up or having creative input, but hey man, I feel like someone of Richard's caliber, you gotta fucking take it. That's that was a great idea. And can you imagine not seeing that? On camera, I mean, you know, I, I feel like all ideas are good. You gotta just try them out, and you know, uh, it's true. You gotta hope for the best. Yeah, hope for the best. It really just shows the environment and atmosphere that Carpenter laid out, and the relationship he had with these actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about our next guest, someone that we're really impressed by, and I can't believe he's on the show. Oh my God, this guy! This is a dream, dream come true. Keith David, who played Child. Yeah, an amazing actor. You've heard his voice in, in Rick oh and Morty, Cargoyles. You've seen him, you know, in in Tales from the Hood. I mean, he amazing is just- Amazing voice. Just, yeah, he's he's the best. And this is his first feature film. That's right. Well, let's, let's roll that. Take it away, Keith. What was your road to landing the thing? You know, that's an amazing role that you had. And I believe that was your, your major breakout role. No, it was crazy long ago. <laughs> my, you call it my major breakout role. It was my first movie. Yeah. <laughs> it was fantastic. And I was on the road with the acting company doing Shakespeare around the country. And I came in, had, had an audition. For the following four weeks, I was doing Midsummer Night's Dream up at the American Conservatory Theater. You know, I hadn't heard from them in a month, so I figured I probably didn't get that job. After, after I came off the road, I had saved up just enough money so that I could spend the summer in Milwaukee doing my speech teacher training because I couldn't wait tables. That wasn't my temperament. So I decided to become a speech teacher to help to supplement, you know, uh, my time and my income when I wasn't acting. Uh, so my, we were sitting in Phoebe's and my girl says to me, Oh, honey, I'm sorry. You're not going to be able to. You're not going to be able to uh, go to Milwaukee. And I said, Oh, sh why not? She said, Because you got the movie. And I said, What? What? Oh my God! Oh my God! Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so I that love was that. nice. She really got me on that nice. thing. So I was like, Hey, let me buy everybody a drink. One drink for everybody. <laughs> I love it. That's great. And what was the experience like shooting it? What was your day to day like getting in the workflow of it all? The day to day started on a sound stage at Universal. The ex, you know, a lot of stuff was recreated inside of the sound stage. It, it was kept at twenty degrees. Did they tell you that? Yeah. And you'd go oh, yeah. from twenty degrees inside to eighty degrees outside, uh, or more. Uh, when we got to Alaska, yes, as I remember it. And you know how selective memory can be. We had about six hours of daylight because we were there in November during the winter time. We left like November 30th, right after Thanksgiving, and we came back a couple of days before Christmas. I think we were there for like three weeks. The sun started to come up around 9 a.m., and it went, started getting dark about 3 p.m. By 7 o'clock, it was dark. Oh. By 8 o'clock, it felt like midnight. You know, we, we spent a lot of time going from our hotel to yeah. the one of the one of the you know local pubs or you know we, it, it was, there was there was the Hyder Inn. I mean, it was a big mining town, so all the miners used to hang out. The, the most memorable night that we had now. I remember going there. I counted fifty eight men to one woman. So you know, 
There were only like four, four, four or five women yeah. in the town. So it's like, you can imagine, that's like 150 guys, you know. You know. And just, just a few women. So, so it, did, it didn't matter, you know, who was with yeah. these women. They were being scrutinized, both the men and the women. Now you can imagine, because, you know, it was only two black guys. There was three of us. Melvin, who was our stand-in. <laughs> And yeah. stunt double. But the night that we were hanging out, I think it was just oh, TK man. and myself. I love Melvin these, might have been there. Yeah. He might. But I know it was just TK and myself. And of course, you know, there was this one, the one girl who wanted to hang out. And, uh, uh, and she and TK were, you know, kind of, you know, drinking together and keeping company. And every eye in the place was on the two of them. And the ones that weren't were on me. So, you know, and we, you know, we're all drinking, but, you know, with all these, you know, with, with, in a room full of rednecks, <laughs> oh I didn't want to get too drunk, you know. So, uh, yeah. I, but I wound up getting drunk anyway. Right. You got to. It, it, it didn't start out that way. Well, well because uh, uh, on, on one occasion, I was walking through the club and one of the guys says, hey, come on, have a drink. <laughs> and I was like, uh, that's okay, fellas. I don't know. No, no. And he said, no, no, no. Have a drink, you know. <laughs> so I was not going to get away with not having a drink. So, so. Oh, man. <laughs> we had many. In fact, that's the night that I discovered a flaming fuzzy fud pucker. What's that? Oh, I need to know. That was the drink of the night. A flaming fuzzy is a double shot of tequila in a highball glass that sits inside of a saucer filled with Yukon Jack which is a liqueur. So you squeeze a piece of lemon into the tequila. You throw it back. You blow out the flames <laughs> from the uh, Yukon Jack, and then you drink that. So it's, it's warm, it's sweet. It's... Oh, you know. man. So your character, Childs, is uh, such a badass. You come in with the flamethrower all the time. And working with Kurt Russell, uh, what was that like? You know, like I said, it's my first movie, so every every moment is a, is thrilling. On the set, of course, everybody wants to <laughs> handle the flamethrower. Yeah. You know, it's really it's really cool. But actually, it it put me very uptight because, uh, you know, as fun as it looks, I have to make it look. That's my job is to make it look professional, like I'm doing this my whole life. When the fact of the matter is, I'd never handled anything like that in my life. In the real in the real world, it's there's a there's a, a mixture of napalm inside of that gasoline, which makes it stick to whatever it touches. And it's such a hair trigger, you can't you know you don't want to keep your hand on the trigger because if you touch that trigger, that gas shoots out and the flame it you know it you know at the same time that you pull the trigger. It releases the liquid. It also has uh, um, like a flint that it, it, it ignites a flame. So when you pull the trigger, liquid and mm. fire shoots out. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, mean, I was quite nerve wracked because it's like it only takes one accident and you're <laughs> the biggest asshole in town. And... And and dangerous, you know. I mean, it's dangerous. It's well, you, dangerous also, so. you also get shot at. I know it was a fake thing, but that's terrifying for your first movie. You know, <laughs> but all all that's fun. All that's you know, it's cops and robbers. Yeah, you yeah. Know what I mean? yeah, that's great. And what what was your favorite scene? You know, of the film, I I love the ending scene. It had an impact of just you guys at the end. It's a it's it's a really like holy shit. This is what you both have been through, and this is how you know you're stuck in stuck in the snow. Um, and you're just wondering what's going to happen to you guys at the end. Um, and you know, it, but I'd love to know what was your favorite scene to shoot or, you know, when, when rewatching the film. One of my favorite scenes is it's a shot over my shoulder to Donald Moffat when they tell him, I don't remember exact words, you know, but they tell him that, you know, it's say, you know, we're doomed basically. Um, and it's a it's a shot. You know, it starts out as as a two shot, and then the camera creeps in slowly over my shoulder, and to a close up of Donald, and his face just gets totally ashen and white, 
And I used to watch, I, I mean, you know, as soon as it passed my shoulder, I would sneak under the camera just so I could turn around and look at him because with no words, it was, the, the, you know, the acting was so supreme. He just, he just, he heard the news and it just, he just took it in and it mattered to him. You know, that's, that's not easy to do. I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's what, that's what, you know, you live for as an actor to be able to take it that personally and not have to act. He, cause his face, he didn't raise an eyebrow. He didn't stick his tongue out. He didn't do any facial gesticulations. You just saw his face completely lose blood. It was, it's a, it's a wonderful moment. If you, when, the next time you see the movie, Think of that moment. It's just past my shoulder, onto Donald Moffat hearing the bad news. It's it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yes, I also really love your line when you go, "I don't believe any of this voodoo bullshit." <laughs> right, and it really it it really so is a, it, it really is a great line because it's like you know you know yeah what what Let's is see. what is this happy horse shit you know? Thank you so much, Keith David. Wow, what a what a great story about his first feature and experience. Yeah, I mean, I love, I love like watching him and just like to know how big of a celebrity he is now and how big of an actor he is. This was his first thing ever, and he's so young, he's so like becoming and chipper yes. and just like yes. you. I mean, he's so young looking, and he's has an awesome role. Just like yes, you know, give me the flame throw a child's like all of, <laughs> yeah, all this shit is just like oh my god, he's such a and not to mention it ends with him and Kurt Russell. Yeah, spoiler alert. Hero. Sorry, don't kill me. Spoilers. Yeah, it's he. he I'm glad yeah. that he is. He is the hero. Yeah, and and I love. I love it when Kurt Russell is kind of questioning. Childs, him. man, has that voice. That voice is Childs right there. You can't take that away. So <laughs> good. Um, you know, there there really are just a lot of great scenes in this movie. Um, and you know, we've been trying to figure out what what our favorite scene is. Yeah. And, and what, what's a great sort of cap off, you know? And I don't know about you, Bon, but my two favorite scenes has to be the blood testing. Yeah. Because it's so, like, nerve-wracking. You're like, oh, my God, tension is building. You finally have some sort of proof that your friend could be this fucking thing. And yeah. I fucking love the ending uh, yeah. where uh, Keith David and Kurt Russell have that ending dialogue when it's just... You know them two left. What do you think? I I love yeah I love the ending yeah. too. I, I really think it shows a testament of their uh, bond, and it also makes me thirsty for scotch. Yeah, which we're drinking right now. Cheers. Exactly. Cheers. <laughs> and I really think it's one of the best sort of endings that opens your mind as a, the audience. You're like these guys are yeah. stuck in the cold surrounded by flames and when will they ever get discovered will they get help um so so i think i agree with you it really is a beautiful ending to the movie and i think it's time that we rewind it oh, let's rewind it baby it's my favorite part of the podcast huh. let's go rewind you're the only one who made it not the only one did you kill it? Where were you, Childs? I thought I saw Blair. I went out after. Got lost in the storm. <laughs> Fire's got the temperature up all over the camp. Won't last long, though. Neither will we. How will we make it? Maybe we shouldn't. If you're worried about me. If we got any surprises for each other, I don't think we're in much shape to do anything about it. Well, what do we do? Why don't we just wait here for a little while, see what happens. Uh. 
Well, that was our show, everyone. We also do a lot of comedy and sketches. We have a web series on YouTube, Facebook, you, you know, Vimeo, all the platforms, Twitter. Follow us. Yes, check us out. Yeah, give us a follow, send us a DM. And go check out The Thing if you haven't seen it. Um, definitely check it out. If you have seen it, you should check it out again and spread it around. Yeah. Thanks to Ruben Dax for mixing and mastering this episode. Oh, yes. And of course, thank, Huge you thank you to the talent. You guys rock. Uh, that were involved. Thank you, Peter Maloney, Richard Masser, Keith David, all stars. See you guys next time. Bye bye. Hello. Bye bye. Bobo Touch. Uh.